a level of oh my goodness it shows a level of, of interest in the, the local health service so um welcome to you all i just want to first of all introduce uh, these guys um, so that you know who everyone is uh, if uh, i can first of all introduce uh, paul gray who's the Di director general health and chief exec of the nhs uh, scotland uh, then we have john matheson who's the director of health finance e-health and analysis and then we have at the end john conaghan who's the nhs scotland's chief operating officer uh, i should have started of course by introducing myself um, i'm shona robertson the cabinet secretary for health well-being and sport uh, so very pleased to, to see you all um, and of course um, on my, my right we have uh, professor uh, stephen logan who's the, the chair of nhs uh, grampian and we have uh, Malcolm Wright, who's the interim uh, chief executive. So, uh, I just wanted to say a, a few comments uh, to set the scene a little bit and then just to say a word about how the proceedings will be conducted this afternoon for those of you who have maybe not been to a, an annual review uh, before. Uh, this, this event, the annual review, which each health board undergoes, uh, is to really look at the performance over the last year of the board but importantly to look forward uh, to the the plans uh, for the health service in the local area uh, going forward over the next few weeks and months it's an opportunity for us to to question uh, some of those plans it's an opportunity for you to question us uh, about whatever you want to, to question we'll come on to that after the, the first part of the, the meeting. You know, at the end of the day, it's all of you that, that pay for the health service through your taxes, and it's a, a huge public service, but I think one that we should be extremely proud of, um, a service which across the whole of Scotland treats so many people. We've all been touched by the health service in one way or another. So it doesn't always get it right, and I'm sure we'll hear today about some of those challenges but it quite often does get it right, and I think it's a service we should we should we should be proud of. Um, the service here in Grampian has, without doubt, had challenges over the, the last few uh, months and, and year, years, in fact. And um, you know, you will have seen some of the reports that I have seen. I've spoke about spoken about those reports in Parliament. There's been a great deal of of interest in them. I think. Though what I found when I visited Grampian before Christmas and indeed here today is a sense of wanting to, to move forward. You have a, a great dedicated staff team here in Grampian. You have some great facilities. We were pleased to be able to announce uh, some additional resources which Grampian will get the next financial year, a uh, £49 million uh, investment bringing Grampian uh, into to parity and uh, uh, with other boards which will help the these guys to deliver and accelerate some of the changes to service that they want to see happen uh, over the next few months and years so so that's important someone said to me earlier on this morning that they felt there was a, a fresh breeze blowing through grampian now you know it, it might be a, a a small breeze but I get a sense of, of renewal and, and sense of purpose, and, and that's very, very important as we go forward. This morning, I visited uh, Wood, Wood End Hospital to see for myself some of the improvement work going on there, and I was very impressed. Um, I also had a, a private visit to, to A&E to see for myself uh, what the challenges, but also the great staff team that have been working there very hard over the festive season. In, in challenging circumstances. So the review itself is going to, to be in, in two sessions. The first in public um, is going to be, as I said earlier, structured around the, the board's performance in the key areas that, and some of the challenges that we, we set the board. And shortly, uh, the board chair is going to undertake a, a short presentation on these areas. Uh, at about half past one, I want to be in a position to hand over to, to yourselves to be able to ask any questions that uh, you have and then we'll go into the second session of the review which is uh, going to be a, a private session with the full board and ourselves to probe a little bit more deeply some of their, their plans. 
So without any further ado from me, you've probably heard enough from me, I'll hand over to Professor Logan, who's going to begin his presentation. reiterate the Cabinet Secretary's welcome to you here uh, to NHS Grampian. As you will know, this is only my second week as Chairman of the Board, so uh, whilst I've had very many important meetings with staff before Christmas and uh, subsequent to then, there's still a lot of work to do on my part. So I'm going to be very brief. I want to just um, set a bit of the agenda from my perspective, and I'll use uh, uh, Malcolm Wright will talk about more of the detailed information that's uh, relevant to this particular meeting. I believe, um, although there are um, uh, challenging uh, events ahead of us, we do start from a very excellent baseline. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has already said it, and I'll reiterate it. We have an outstanding team of healthcare professionals uh, here in, in Grampian, both uh, clinical staff and management who are fully committed to the service here in NHS Grampian and on every occasion will go that extra mile to ensure that very high quality of service. Of course, I and my colleagues on the board recognise the need for continuous improvement. There is work to be done and we're confident that we'll be able to do that working with the executive team and with professionals throughout NHS Grampian. I think it's important that the leadership from the board indicates that we can create the services across Grampian that are of the quality that our communities deserve, both in the acute sector and in the primary care sector. It's well, important we do that. Uh, NHS Grampians committed to caring, it's committed to listening, and most critically, it's committed to improving. Um, I'll be working with my colleagues on the board to ensure that we deliver that over the next period of time. And I'm going to hand over now to Malcolm Wright to talk about the detail of our, our performance and some of the challenges and some of the methods in which we're going to address it in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm Wright. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Cabinet Secretary. It's a great privilege to be asked to be the Interim Chief Executive of NHS Grampian. In terms of my introductory comments, I want to say, first of all, that I think this has been a challenging period for NHS Grampian, and we've got a very strong foundation to build on, which is rooted in quality and in safety. I think some of the challenges come from the HIS review, from the Royal College of Surgeons report, from some of the winter pressures that we've been experiencing over recent weeks, and as we seek to improve our performance against uh, access standards. But I think one of the things we've, we've taken reassurance from is that the patient outcomes achieved by NHS Grampian are of a high order. The patient experience as reported by patients is good. And the patient safety that we have here in NHS Grampian as externally measured is also of a high order. So I think it's very important to hold on to these things. And as the chair has said, we've got first class staff, we've got some world class facilities here, and we've got very strong partnerships so the work that we do with our staff side and with our partners in the local authorities and the universities, the colleges and the third sector is absolutely critical to what we do. We want to support and value our staff further. We are committed to improvement and we're committed to partnership working with all of those colleagues that I talked about. Addressing health improvement and health inequalities is at the core of the work of NHS Grampian. And our aim is to improve the health of the whole of the Grampian population and to seek to work with others to reduce inequalities and to give focus to those who are the most vulnerable in our society. And I think there's a number of areas where we're making good progress and we need to do more. So in the whole area of children and early years, our Child Smile programme, for example, some 16,000 children now have daily teeth brushing sessions at nurseries and at primary schools. 
our flu ride varnishing program we wish to improve still further. Our breastfeeding rates are at 35% uh, and, are, and are good compared with national averages. And we've increased our dental registration rate for children to some 86%. All of these things have positive impact on children's health and children's oral health. Our Healthy Working Lives in initiative, we've got 153 organisations now registered and 227 awards made. And our Quit Smoking programme is also working successfully as well. And we are above target in areas of alcohol brief interventions. So there's a whole range of areas where NHS Grampian is doing well, working with partners to improve the health and reduce the inequalities of the population. One of our key strategic priorities moving forward over the coming months is health and social care integration. Now, the coming of the integrated joint boards gives massive opportunities <coughs> to work with colleagues and local authorities and in the third sector to improve the health and well-being of people in our communities. <coughs> and I have to say, we've got a good history of joint working with a range of partners. We've got strong, engaged partnerships. We've got strong and engaged primary care services community services and mental health services, and we've got a good network of community hostels, hospitals to build on. We've already made three good quality appointments in the chief offices of the new integrated joint boards, and we've got transitional leadership groups uh, in all of the three local authorities. And we're on track to bring forward these schemes of establishment uh, to the board uh, for sign-off to be sent to the Scottish Government. We want to make sure that communities are absolutely the heart of what we do in the future, focusing on outcomes of health and well-being and early discharge from uh, acute settings. We've had some real successes as well in patient safety and quality. I won't go through all the detail on this slide, but it's good to see that we've reduced our MRSA uh, rates and our C. difficile rates, again, have seen sharp reductions uh, in recent times, and we've been awarded uh, national awards for our work on patient safety. Also, we've had positive patient experiences. Some 96% of our patients rate the service that they receive from us as being good, very good, or excellent. But we know that we've got a lot to do, both in terms of the quality of our responses to complaints and the way in which we go about making those responses. And I'll speak a bit more about that in a minute. And finally, uh, we've got a first class and engaged uh, workforce and um, we, our own uh, recognition scream, the Grafters Awards and also recognition at the Scottish Healthcare Awards. And we were really encouraged to see as well that some of the work that's been done has resulted in improvements in the annual staff survey and our sickness absence levels track well with the rest of the NHS in Scotland. <coughs> I did say, however, that we've got challenges and we've got opportunities, real challenges and real opportunities. We have been subject to significant scrutiny and just to make it clear that the board has accepted all of the recommendations of all of the reports that have been published and we've apologised unreservedly for any failings that we have had. And we do continue to have challenges in fully meeting access standards and we are absolutely determined to improve these. And of course, winter activity has placed additional pressure on staff. But there's also huge opportunities as well in terms of our staff and patient experience and the inspection reports really demonstrating that the quality and safety of care is high. So we've devised a short-term improvement programme which we have developed and we are implementing in terms of immediate actions that we're taking. And we're seeking to make sure those are well managed, they're coordinated and they're comprehensive. I'm very pleased to say that we've appoint appointed a new general manager for the acute sector, uh, Amanda Croft, who is within the audience today. And that's a key stage in the, in the rebuilding of our management arrangements in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. We're giving a very high priority to taking forward immediate actions for our older people's <laughs> services in acute settings and improving the consistency of care, the consistency of documentation, and the escalation and the discharge processes are of a high priority to us. We've confirmed support for medical management within the system, and uh, posts are now being filled, uh, which will support the medical director in critical areas of education and training, practice and performance, quality, and we will appoint a deputy medical director who will have a general practice background. Because putting general practice and primary care at the heart of what we do is really important for the future. And last but by no means least, we've made significant process, progress in relation to the issues raised with the Royal College of Surgeons report, and we are uh, getting positive engagement uh, from that part of the hospital. 
Workforce challenges, of course, are a major area for us, and I'm pleased to report that we have improved by over 200 uh, our nursing staffing uh, levels within the system, and we have committed in next year's plans to a further 30 to 40, um, which will be tracked through our local delivery plan. And we've got a real focus on seeing what more we can do to recruit to existing posts and reduce the number of vacancies. We've been working with Scottish Government and local partners about affordable housing uh, opportunities. So on the Forester Hill site, working with Aberdeen Council on surplus sites um, and uh, the, the, the prison in terms of um, uh, the public sector's workers' accommodation. So we want Grampian to be and continue to be a centre of excellence for teaching and research. And I'm pleased to say that we've improved the, the level of uh, translation of qualified uh, nursing students from uh, Robert Gordon's University into post within NHS Grampian. And that's something we'll work intensively with Robert Gordon's University to further improve. And on the medical side with Aberdeen University, working closely with them to see how can we link in academic appointments into clinical appointments and making sure that training, teaching, high quality research uh, is at the heart of every clinical department within this system. And last but by no means least, we want to make sure that this is an attractive place for trainees to live and to learn and to build uh, a career. So working with the universities is of critical importance. <coughs> I'd like at this stage, Cabinet Secretary, to say a huge thank you to all staff for their performance to date in manage managing winter pressures. And that's not just in the acute sector, but we've seen some fantastic examples of staff going above and beyond the call of duty there, but also our colleagues in primary care in the GMED uh, service. And we've seen uh, 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 appointments by them rising significantly from the same time and last year. But I can say that in the two weeks of the festive period, uh, some 90, over 90% 90 of patients were treated and seen within the four-hour uh, target. And I think given the very significant pressures, I think that as a very good achievement from our staff. And while overall numbers of admissions and referrals to the emergency department are broadly similar to last year, there's been some 25% increase in the number of major cases. So I think our staff have coped absolutely magnificently. So to support that, we've uh, in implemented uh, a step-down facility in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which can take up to 20 patients and a discharge lounge. We have key meetings within the infirmary and with our partners to review the situation on a daily basis. And we also estimate, and this is where the general practitioners come in, um, that up to 30% of um, attendances within the A&E department can and many are appropriately and more appropriately seen by a general practitioner or an emergency care practitioner. And we've approved over two and a half million pound of investment in enhanced multidisciplinary team support for the front door of Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Uh, so I think these are really important investments. And we've made sure that every household in Grampian has got information as to where best it is to go. We're seeking to improve, we have improved, and we need to further improve our, our uh, access time performance. And I'm very pleased to say that we've seen significant improvements in the area of orthopaedics and dermatology, and there are a number of other specialties where we want to see further improvement. Our cancer targets against the 31-day target, we're now up to 98%, and the system is working very hard, and we need to have further improvements towards the 62-day target. So improving our access to diagnostic uh, services is essential. And last but by no means least, access to mental health services and psychological therapies, we want to do uh, better at that. And coming to a conclusion, Cabinet Secretary, the healthcare system has uh, delivered financial break-even. We will deliver financial break-even despite a challenging external pressures. And we've invested in excess of £10 million in additional staffing over the last two financial years using additional funding provided by the Scottish Government. We've got an ambitious capital programme of £54 million in the Aberdeen Health Village, Woodend, Forest Health Centres, additional theatres at ARI, uh, and, and so forth. And we're committed to further investments in primary care premises over the next five years, and that's in excess of £40 million, and a replacement of the maternity hospital and the new cancer centre, which will be £120 million. And we've already committed as a board the first £9 million of that to get the enabling works and the planning work uh, underway. 
And I think, Cabinet Secretary, the Board would wish to warmly welcome not only the progress in moving towards NRAC that was previously agreed, but moving towards it to get within 1% of our uh, share, population share of funding by the beginning of next financial year. So bringing that forward by a year gives the healthcare system a massive opportunity to improve the quality of care and the investments that we have still further. So that, that is hugely helpful, and getting this announcement at this time really helps us to plan uh, for our services well before the start of the financial year. So in conclusion, Cabinet Secretary, working towards 2020, the Board's priorities will be um, commitment to making health and social care integration really work, a focus on keeping people well at home, focusing on implementing our comprehensive improvement programme, not just on the inspection report, but improvement to access and waiting times, a supported and engaged workforce and community, and this is where we're working with our, our staff side, and continue to make significant investments in new modern healthcare facilities and innovative ways of delivering healthcare. Cabinet Secretary, I do think that this healthcare system has got first-class staff. We've got some world-class facilities here. We've got strong partnership arrangements with our staff side and strong partnerships with our universities, our colleges, our local authorities and the third sector. And with the announcements on funding, uh, we are well positioned to be, if not the top performing healthcare system in Scotland, certainly one of the top performing healthcare systems in Scotland. And I think there's a number of health boards around Scotland who would be very pleased to be in the situation we are in uh, financially. So given those things that I've said, I sense a mood of optimism, of renewal, of moving forward and really tackling some of the issues that we've, uh, we've come to understand. So I think the, the NHS Grampian Cabinet Secretary recognises fully the challenges that we've got and is responding to those challenges with a sense of determination and purpose and we've got great strengths to build on and we expect to make further and sustained improvements over the coming 12 months. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Malcolm. Ladies and gentlemen, this is now the time for an open question and answer session. There is a roving microscope, and I'd ask you if you'd um, raise your hand. <laughs> microphone, sorry. A, mi a microscope for our purposes. <laughs> There'll be two roving things, a microscope and a microphone. Um, if you would identify yourself, it would be helpful, just for the record. So here's one at the front here. My name's Kevin Hutchins. I'm here as a member of the public today. Um, but I was particularly concerned about the uh, state of uh, the maternity provision in terms of the uh, state of cleanliness. And I saw the reports. And I think what particularly concerned me, and I did show it to a nurse, and she shared my concerns, is that two announced visits were followed by an unannounced visit that actually identified the same problems. And I believe that there have been further inspection reports that have also expressed concern about rust in the operating theatre and issues such as that. And I have uh, among my friends nurses who I've spoken to who are concerned that, yes, there are new initiatives taking place, but the level of staffing to actually deal with that is not sufficient, particularly at the nursing level. So I'd be quite interested to hear the views of the minister and also the views of the staff in Grampian NHS. Thank you. I mean, just, just to say a word about the inspection regime, um, I think the introduction of the inspection regime through um, the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate has been hugely important. Not always comfortable reading, but before that we actually didn't know in detail what was necessarily going on in all of our hospitals. So the fact we have these announced and unannounced inspections, to me, are, are really, really important because they shine a light on every part of the system and sometimes that is uncomfortable but I would rather a light was shone and then action taken to address than not. So then of course what happens is there is a, a list of recommendations that have to be implemented and those are checked upon. There's the Health uh, Care uh, Improvement Scotland will work with uh, those managers and staff to help them make the improvements that they need to make and these guys will be absolutely making sure that the improvements are carried through. Now, sometimes you go back and there's still issues to be resolved. And again, that will be reiterated. Um, 
I'm on the, the staffing side and I'll, I'll um, hand over locally in a sec to say a bit more about that. Um, I think there, there's a focus very much in Grampian now about getting the appropriate level of nursing uh, resource. It is a challenge to recruit in this area, probably the, the most significant in, in Scotland, very, very difficult given the cost of living. So we have to really you know, be very, very um, uh, robust and imaginative in, in some ways about the, the, the ways we can recruit uh, into this health service here. Not, it's not just an issue for the health service, it's an issue for all uh, public services in this area. So that's why we're looking at things like the, the housing affordable housing solutions to, to be a bit more imaginative about how we can overcome some of the barriers to, to recruitment. But maybe hand over just about the detail. Yes, happy to take uh, that on. And either Eleanor or, or Pauline might want to come in on the back of this. But I, I, think, I think the point is well made about the, the, the cleanliness and I think absolute ongoing vigilance. And as the Cabinet Secretary says, the point of the inspections, particularly the unannounced ones, uh, is that they're unannounced and they find things, and if they find things, then we're committed to putting them right. So we're in no way complacent around that, though I think our overall performance on cleanliness is actually a good one. It's not unrelated towards uh, nursing uh, staffing levels, and I think we do accept that there are some significant numbers of nursing staffing vacancies within the system. Uh, but you know what I try to demonstrate is that we're seeking to improve our nursing staffing levels last year, this year, and, and next year. And I think one of the, the critical things is being able to recruit. So I think that work I was describing with Robert Gordon's university and translating more of their uh, undergraduates uh, and graduates into jobs within NHS Grampian is going to be really important. And return to work. Uh, schemes, return to practice schemes, we, you know, we're working on those and getting affordable um, housing uh, options, you know, some of which we can do ourselves, some of which we're working with the, uh, the local authority. But Eleanor, would you like to come in? Yes, d just a, a couple of points around the maternity staffing. We've been using the national tools that, that have been developed to look at our staffing, particularly there. So, and we, and as a result of additional resources, we did actually target additional matern midwives and additional neonatal nurses, so 10 of each, and we'll keep looking at our staffing there to try and make sure that it continues to improve. Sorry, um, I'm Pauline Strachan, I'm Deputy Chief Executive for NHS Grampian. Uh, you're absolutely right, the findings, the HIS findings of the inspection of the maternity hospital were unacceptable and I would reiterate uh, Malcolm's apology to the public for that. Um, and the, the issue is that it's quite difficult to get all the right levels of staff in place at the right time every time. Um, and therefore we do have to be innovative about how we use the staff. One of the things that we're looking at and we've put in place right now is, a, is what we call a bed busting team. Because one of the things that, that has to happen after every single patient is in our hospital is the bed area needs to be thoroughly, thoroughly cleaned. No more so than, than in the maternity hospital itself, which many of you will realise can be quite a messy experience at a birth. Um, so we've put in place, these are, uh, these are not registered nurses, but these are highly trained cleaning health support care worker staff in order to help us with that. That releases the midwives to be able to do the work that only they can do, the clinical work with the patient. The other thing to say is, and, um, and it's very linked to, to what has been said earlier, is a new maternity hospital will make such a huge difference. Our own, own maternity hospital at the moment is a very aged building. Um, medical practice, clinical practice, maternity practice has moved on enormously um, since it was built last century. Um, and, and so that the, the new building will make such a big difference, it'll be much easier to clean, it's much easier to keep clean and much easier for clinical practice as well. Thank you, good afternoon. I'm Dave Duff, I'm chair of the Murray Diabetes UK group. Uh, and I just want some assurance from the new regime that uh, is taking over at Grampian NHS that there will be an improved priority given to diabetes, a recognition that one in five people have or are at risk of this very serious condition, uh, a condition that costs the NHS millions of pounds, uh, and a lot of the cost of it is treating the complications, the avoidable complications, 
complications that can be avoided by good proper care that is just not available in many parts of Grampian uh, and coming from Murray of course my uh, priority is the care that is available for people with diabetes in Murray. Uh, we often feel we're at the outskirts and not really given that much attention uh, in a bit of a postcode lottery within Grampian uh, where the, we have some wonderful staff up there. Uh, the staff that are there are fantastic, but they're just not enough of them. We need more uh, consultants, especially in the pediatric side. We need more DSNs, diabetic specialists in the nursing, in the dietetics, in the pod podiatrics, podiatry services, uh, and especially, which a service that just doesn't exist up there virtually, is in the psychological services. Uh, we really, really are crying out. Uh, I know of one person who's waiting a year for an appointment for a child psychologist for their young child who has uh, diabetes. Uh, it's a really serious condition, and if more priority and attention was given to diabetes care, uh, then a lot of the complications could be avoided in the long term. Uh, most people with diabetes especially type 2s, are cared for on the basis of a five, one five-minute chat with a GP every year or maybe twice a year if they're lucky, and it's just not enough. Uh, we really need more priority to be given to diabetes and want to some assurance that this is going to be forthcoming now. Please. I'm, I'm sure Malcolm will, will deal with the, the specifics around the services in, in Maui and, and the rest of Grampian. I think just a, a very briefly from me, um, my mum's a type 2 diabetic and uh, it's a, an issue that I know very, very closely that if it's not absolutely um, uh, contained and treated <coughs> with the right support, then the complications can be quite devastating. So podiatry services, the uh, dietitian services, very, very important. I think just to say to you that we have made a, a, a recent significant investment in child and ad adolescent mental health services, an uh, additional 15 million. So I want to look at obviously the plans around uh, mental health services in the Grampian area. I know that that's a, a priority. We were talking about that this morning. Uh, so I think the more, in some ways, uh, in an area like Grampian with um, such a, a large rural hinterland, it is about getting that balance of what can appropriately be delivered within the, the more uh, remote and rural areas and, and what needs to be delivered within within the centre and getting that balance, particularly for uh, diabetic services, is very, very important. Um, Malcolm, do you want to? Yes, thank you for that. And, and, and I too, Kevin, the Secretary, I've got close relatives with type 2 diabetes, so I have a, a little uh, insight into it. I might bring in our medical director, Nick Fluck, in, 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 in a second. Um, maybe two or three things from me. W one, I will be visiting services in, in Murray on Thursday of this week uh, and will specifically you know, ask about that. Um, secondly, I'd s give a commitment outside this meeting. If you want to have a conversation at the end, I'd be very happy to do that, but I'll give a commitment to ha have a, a, a look at all of that. Thirdly, I think I acknowledged in the presentation there's a number of recruitment difficulties around uh, psychologists generally and, and child psychology you know, is one of those um, areas and there's a number of initiatives going on to see if we can uh, uh, improve things there too. But I think the heart of a good uh, diabetic service is around community services based around uh, primary care with specialist uh, outreach. Um, and I'm very happy to have a look at that. But Nick, would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I'm Nick <coughs> Flutley, Medical Director. I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right, and I take all your points on board. Um, diabetes, obviously, is, is one of many chronic diseases, and the implications of those are very extensive. Um, I've also got a vested interest. I'm a nephrologist by background, so the complications of diabetes are very close to my heart. I mean, I think the opportunity here is actually around the integration agenda, because as you describe it, diabetes as such a serious chronic illness touches many people in many different disciplines, in many professions, right across health and social care integration. So really the opportunity we have around um, are the integrated joint boards of strategically planning services that cross from uh, health needs, social care needs, uh, right across the community and involving everyone 
is the opportunity to make diabetes, diabetic services better. So again, um, as with Malcolm, very happy to pick up at the end and discuss some of the specifics around diabetic service provision related to Elgin and the Murray area, um, but really to say that this, um, the commitment against chronic diseases is very, very strong, and I think that's what health and social care integration really is about. Thank you. Eileen Brown, Chair of Elderly Monitoring Group in Aberdeen. I am told that the waiting list for some illnesses is 50 weeks, uh, particularly rheumatoid arthritis. This doesn't only affect the patient, it's the community of people who are supporting them. And you have large numbers of the, pop of the population who are very stressed, as well as the patient, because of the lengthy waiting time. Is, do you see any improvement in uh, unacceptable waiting times as they are just now? Yes, I, I completely ag agree with you. and all of the all of the support services um, around about and I think what I was trying to demonstrate in my presentation is that, I, that we know that we need to further improve our, our waiting time performance I think there's a number of areas where we've made real progress there's a number of areas where we want to make further progress and just to be you know really clear um, you know meeting the commitment to the treatment time guarantees uh, is a high uh, level of priority for for this board and for the executive team and NHS Grampian. So it's an area I would wish to see significant change and improvement on over the coming months. And I think, you know, the financial, you know, it's not unrelated to the financial uh, settlement that, that we've got, that, that will help. And that will help to bring expenditure we plan for two years forward into, into next financial year. And I think really to focus on recruitment of staff and retention of staff you know, the, all of these things are in, interlinked. But, you know, to get to your absolute point, um, you know, th these things do affect not just the patient, but the immediate family, and we want to further improve what we're doing. Uh, and I would ask uh, Nick as well <coughs> just to respond to that, the medical director. <coughs> uh, thanks very much. Uh, completely agree. It's unacceptable to wait that length of time to see someone. I think in addition to try and improve those types of waits, we're also looking at sort of a much more innovative ways of connecting specialist services together with uh, individuals, patients, and their primary care physicians and the community. So um, uh, again, this is an opportunity under the sort of uh, health and social care integration, and we're doing lots of work with our primary care uh, colleagues, an initiative called Connect, where GPs and hospital doctors work together around these types of pathways to really put timely specialist advice in the hands of patients and GPs as quickly as possible. So there are ways for us to get the advice in the right place at the right time without necessarily having to rely on traditional methods of referring people into outpatients um, as the only solution. Um, Hazel Carnegie, I'm here as a member of, of the public, but uh, I've been very well aware, as we all have, of the recruitment issues that um, NHS Grampian has faced. And I'm actually wondering to what extent the research interests of the University Medical School have influenced the recruitment of some of the specialists, for example, in oncology, where obviously there is a huge competition to get uh, top class people. I have had some insight into um, what happens in at Nine Wells, for example, and it does appear that they have had less of an issue in recruitment in these areas. Perhaps I could answer that um, at the first level. Um, you're right, Nine Wells, the University at Nine Wells is a world-recognized center for cancer research. University of Aberdeen also has excellence in those areas and the university is recruited in those areas, but these are very competitive areas to recruit into. And one of the, one of the main planks moving forward is going to be to strengthen the alignment between what the university and the hospital can do in terms of spe specific recruitment in those areas to attract the very best specialists here at Aberdeen. 
Yes, no, I can I, I add to that. I think the, um, the success of the NHS in Grampian is absolutely closely linked to the success of the university in, in Aberdeen. And the more that we can do to, as the chair says, align those interests and making sure that as we take forward consultant appointments, they've got academic sessions in their, in their job plans, they've got the opportunities to do research, because I think the reputation of Aberdeen University and Robert Gordon's University and the reputation of um, NHS Grampian actually are very, very closely linked. Hello, I've, I'm here today as a member of the public and a human rights activist. I worked in the caring profession for a couple of years and some of the people, some of the staff I was working with, they were absolutely scary. I also worked in a private nursing home and some of the things I witnessed, for instance, we'd all sit in the staff room howling with laughter, somebody would be dying in the next room. I thought that was totally inappropriate. And um, on the first day, one of the staff said to me, you're too nice to work here. And I was very puzzled by that. But it turns out to be true. I used to be so upset before I went to my work because I was witnessing such horrible things. I mean, the verbal abuse, the fact that people are making an inspection, the verbal abuse won't it won't be happening, but they are there. So what I'm saying is the attitude of the staff needs to change. Can I say, um, I think one of the most important things we need to get right is absolutely the to improve the perception um, of working in the care sector because we need to attract new people to the care sector, we need to attract really well motivated people to the care sector and we are looking very closely at how we can make improvements to do that. A huge challenge in this area because uh, again with the cost of living in the Aberdeen area uh, we know that the local authorities and the private care agencies have huge difficulties recruiting for care at home and care home services and that has an impact on delayed discharge and so on and so forth. One thing um, I'll send you some information on if we can get your details at the end is a new um, piece of legislation which in itself won't dramatically change things but it's part of I guess changing the culture and it's about a duty of candour. So for those people working in um, a nursing home who are registered nurses, for example, uh, would have a duty of candour, which is about a duty that we might all think is pretty logical and should happen anyway, but I think it sends out a very clear message. A duty to speak out and report things that are not right. So if staff members, whether it would be yourself or someone else, see something or hear something that's not right, that they have a duty of candour to report that and then for, importantly, action to be taken to address that. Now, as I said, it's not a magic bullet to address um, those issues. And let's face it, you get good and bad in any profession. But what it does is, yet again, provide a, a safeguard uh, by making it very clear that whether it's a nursing home or a hospital, the culture should be of tackling bad practice. Um, so what I'll do, um, if we can get your details at the end, is I'll send you some more information about that and some of the other work that we're doing to try and improve uh, standards within the, the care system. I would just add, we, we expect the very high standards of behaviour from all of our staff in NHS Grampian and we will ensure that um, they operate at those very high standards and we'd welcome um, uh, information from members of the public and otherwise if they feel that is not the case. Hi, uh, my name's Emma Swift. I actually work for Lewis MacDonald MSP, who can't be here today due to a prior engagement. But um, I have a quick question for Malcolm Wright um, in relation to the RCS report, which you mentioned earlier. Um, obviously, only part of that 
report has been made public, including the background, which identifies the hepatobiliary service as the catalyst, for want of a better word, for the investigation. The recommendations then don't mention anything further about that service. I assume the conclusions have more information, but understand that the conclusions are those bits that can't be published. I was wondering if you'd like to take this opportunity to detail what's in those conclusions in relation specifically to the hepatobiliary service. Yes, I'm very happy to, to do that. I mean, I think the, the key point that needs to be made is that those uh, cases that were identified, the hepatobiliary cases that were identified, those have been reviewed and the hepatobiliary service is, is safe and clinically appropriate. And I think we're absolutely clear on that. I'm looking at my medical director. Nick, would you? Yeah, yes, I'd, I'd like to reiterate that. I mean, the cases um, uh, from the hepatobiliary service have now been looked at twice, and categorically, we have not unearthed problems in terms of the safety of that service. They are an excellent service. They're well engaged with all the national audit and reporting uh, systems, so we don't have any concerns to take forward from that point of view. I, I guess slightly just on a second point, um, the structure of the report was one in which there isn't a set of conclusions that um, the impression is given that we've withheld. It's very much a narrative report where 80 or so individuals in the service have been interviewed to give all of their experiences and views on the service, and that's produced huge amounts of details, which are personal details as well as patient confidential details. So it doesn't lend itself well to a publication but lends it to us who have a duty to look at those all systematically and work, sure work through those and I can again say that whether it's for the hepatobiliary service or any of the other sub-disciplines within general surgery we've not found issues related to the safe treatment of patients at all. Cabinet Secretary identified the problems in recruiting uh, to the health service in, uh, in, in this area because of the high cost of living and, and she's right to do so and that seems to be at the heart of many of the challenges the health boards face so can I ask therefore whether any further consideration will be given to introducing an Aberdeen waiting in terms of salaries to as is the case in, in London for example to address similar issues there uh, but also we've all rehearsed um, a great deal over the past few months the problems in the acute sector uh, in terms of delivery and, and we understand the pressures which are there but also I'm now hearing more uh, concerns about future GP provision and GP recruitment as well I'd like to know from uh, the board um, to what extent they've identified this as an issue and what um, action be taken to ensure that there's adequate GP provision in the city as well and in the shire. Um, I mean on the, the issue of recruitment it absolutely um, it's a, a challenge particularly in some specialities and I think part of the reason for that is um, people want more of a work-life balance now within the health service and there are some specialities that are very challenging they're 24 7 and uh, particularly in the emergency side. So it's not just a, an issue for Grampian that those specialities can be challenging elsewhere as well, but the cost of living issues on top of that. And let's face it, some of the difficulties that the board have had uh, and the experience that trainees have had over uh, the years has meant that um, we need to turn the, the, and are turning the reputation of NHS Grampian around to be one of the best places to work. And I think that will help in recruiting some of those specialities. Boards do uh, have the ability where necessary, where they have key shortages and specialities to be able to, uh, to, to use additional payments. Um, and that's something that, that, that could be looked at. But I think that some of the, the, the challenges um, of recruitment here are best dealt with, um, as we've said about reputation being very strong, being a, a, a centre that people want to work in, but also over some of the innovative solutions that we talked about earlier around affordable housing, particularly for those, I'm not saying that's necessarily an issue for, for highly paid consultants, but it might be an issue for nursing staff, midwives, and the staff, the facility staff who keep um, our systems going behind the scenes as well, and that can be very challenging 
uh, when, when you look at uh, uh, the, the cost of living in this city. So um, a lot has been done, but there's clearly uh, more that, that can be done. Um, Malcolm, do you want to? <coughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I could add a few things uh, to that. I mean, I'd like to state publicly and unequivocally that, that GPs are at the heart of primary care and they're at the absolute heart of um, the, the National Health Service here uh, in Grampian. I think one of the things we want to do, and I've had discussions with GP leaders about this, is to develop uh, GP and primary care leadership and how we can uh, really get GPs you know, through into um, you know, more positions of, um, of influence. I think Nick talked about the Connect program, which has been developed by GPs to link up GPs and uh, secondary care, which has been enormously successful. We've given a public commitment that the appointment of the deputy medical director will be a GP, and I think that will be enormously helpful. I think, though, underlying all of that, we've got to make NHS Grampian as a quality training environment where GP trainees and acute trainees actually want to come and, and learn and train and, and build a, a medical career. And that's why that piece with the universities to, to make sure that we are an attractive training environment and we can pull people in to come and work in this, this area that might not do that otherwise. I think the final point to, to make, and I'll maybe ask Annie Ingram, our Director of Workforce, to comment on this, is that we've been working with GPs and recently held a GP Workforce Summit looking at some of the demands for the future, looking at the population increases, looking at some of the new communities, and how can we attract GPs to come and work in this area. But maybe, Annie, would you like to add to that? Thank you, Malcolm. <coughs> um, we had a, a recruitment summit with GPs because, as you will know, sometimes GPs are independent practitioners. They're not actually employed by the board, but we recognise that we need to work together. So what we've done is brought a group of people together to look at a whole range of things, which could include things like better marketing of, of opportunities, looking at how we retain people when they might want to um, begin to retire but want to continue to provide services and make that easy. Um, we're trying to look at initiatives to encourage people to come and working with our partners in NHS Education Scotland. They've had some real success around actually talking up life here because although, yes, it is that there, uh, there is a high cost element to living here, actually you can't, the, the actual quality of life for those of us who are here is actually a really good place to be. So also using um, doctors themselves to talk up the environment that, that you know, you, there is, this is a, a cosmopolitan city, but you can very quickly go and ski, go and climb, go and sail, all of those things to try and encourage people. Because the people who encourage people to come here are the people you're going to work with. So uh, with the GPs have actually done quite a lot of work in saying this is a good place to be because, and we're trying to build on that. We're equally trying to do that with secondary care as well, because we do have a challenge and make sure we, that we can fill all our posts there as well. Thank you, Kevin Stewart, uh, MSP for Aberdeen Central. Uh, and I, I, I welcome the additional funding that's coming to Grampian that has been made today. I think that will make uh, a huge difference. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute to um, the late Brian Adam, who did uh, a, a huge amount in trying to get uh, the right funding formula in place uh, for, for Grampian. Um, two points. Um, uh, in, in your presentation, Malcolm, uh, you talked about trying to gain uh, more recruits uh, from uh, RGU nursing course. Uh, and one of the things which has happened in the past is uh, that there have not been enough training opportunities in Grampian for RGU students. Uh, they've gone elsewhere for some of the training, um, and while they've been away, uh, they've been poached before they've even passed the course. Uh, and sometimes I think that we have been a bit uh, backward in coming forward uh, in dealing with these kind of things in Grampian. How can we improve and ensure that we've got the training opportunities here uh, and that we sign folk up? Uh, before they've necessarily uh, passed their courses as, uh, as other health boards are currently doing. Uh, the second point is round about affordable housing, and I know that efforts are being made, um, but there have been some plans which have been on the table for quite some time, uh, including with Grampian Housing Association, just a wee bit down the road here at Burnside, 104 units, which I think would make a, a, a quite a significant difference. Uh, can I ask uh, where we're at in, in that regard uh, and whether uh, you will continue 
uh, to ensure that you're having those conversations with the social housing providers and the council uh, so that key workers can get first dibs sometimes in, uh, in, these, uh, in these properties. Yes, uh, there's a, at least two things in, in there. W one about training opportunities for students at Robert Gordon's University is not just nurses, it's the whole range of allied health professionals as well. So making sure that A, that there's training opportunities and placement opportunities, and B, that those placement opportunities are of a high standard that the universities can have confidence in and sign up as students on. Uh, and Ellen and I will be meeting the, the Dean of the Faculty of Health and Robert Gordon's within the coming days, and I will make sure that that point is, is, is on the agenda because I think it's a point well made. I think the affordable housing, absolutely, and uh, we were committed to pushing some of those initiatives forward. And I don't know, Alan, our finance director, if you would like to say something about some of the work we're doing and how we could accelerate progress there. Alan Gray, Director of Finance for NHS Grampian. That's right, Kevin, there's been a number of discussions ongoing for a period of time. The one you intimated was in with regard to Grampian Housing Association on the Forest Hill site. As you can appreciate, there's quite a lot to go into in terms of developing these plans, and these plans continue to be made. Uh, we've been looking at the funding arrangements that can be put in place to support that type of development, and we're hoping to progress significantly the discussions over the next six months, and I'm happy to keep you up to date as these things progress. We've also had very good discussions with our local partners, in particular Aberdeen City Council, around land parcels that we have, and also the council have that could be made available for developments for affordable uh, housing, both for rent uh, and for purchase. And of course, we continue to look at a whole range of options with existing developers on new sites about how our staff can uh, meet criteria that allow them to go on with affordable housing. And I uh, mentioned earlier the, the development at uh, former Craig Inch's prison and the potential to convert that site into uh, accommodation for public sector workers more generally, including those in the care, teaching uh, and health professions. So again, I think you're right, affordable housing is a very top priority in terms of dealing with some of the recruitment issues. I think it's one of the areas that we think we can make progress and I think it would make a marked difference in terms of making it an attractive place to come because housing and affordable uh, access to affordable housing is clearly uh, a limiting factor in terms of attracting people to this area. So it will be a key part, and I'm happy to keep you up to date as uh, matters progress during this year. It's just in relation to the, the nurse recruitment. I mean, part of the work that Ellen and I have been taking forward with RGU is actually about how do we catch them much sooner. So investment in mentoring and ensure we've got the right mentoring support when they're with us. Um, but also having a bit more of a journey with them while they go through their training, because ultimately it's, it's our organisation that sign these nurses onto the register. So we're trying to, at an earlier stage in their career, encourage them to come and, and potentially work with us in, in, in a, a non-registered non way so that they can understand what working life is like. A bit more work with them. And we're actually looking into how we can basically guarantee that if they work with us we will be able to appoint people almost match them into jobs ahead of it because you, you, the description you give is quite right and it's something that we do need to address part of that is the addressing the fact that we, we we weren't getting all of the students and they were being poached so we're actively trying to do that and encourage them in and just just for further information about the practice placements too we do uh, do everything we can to have as many practice placements locally as we can. But Robert Gordon University also provides service or, or provides uh, registered nurses to Orkney, Shetland and some of the other areas. So some of the placements have to be there. And we were really pleased that Aberdeen, uh, that Robert Gordon University is training midwives and it's only one of three places in Scotland doing that. So some of the placements are to other areas, but some of that's for good reason. So we're doing as much as we can to do what we can locally as well. Thank you. Um, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary said, I'm the Chief Executive of the NHS in Scotland and I, I've been heavily involved with Grampian really since I started in this role in December 2013. And really, Stephen, two points if I may. The first is there is a genuine sense now of progress. I was in with the Cabinet Secretary in the private discussion in A&E this morning and that service worked hard through the hard times to maintain a safe service. But frankly, looking in from the outside, if you were a, a, an A&E physician or a, a, a nurse, it's probably not a place that would have been first on your list to want to come and work there because it was under a lot of pressure and the, the coverage externally was 
about a service that was facing difficulties. The sense of purpose and direction and calm that has come to that part of Aberdeen Royal Infirmary over the last couple of months was truly evident in what I saw today. So I just want to reassure members of the public here that from where I sit, I can see the progress and it's real. It's not just about graphs trending in the right direction, although that's important. It's about the sense of cohesion and purpose from the executive management team and downwards through the organisation and the non-executive directors contributing to that by appropriate scrutiny. But I do have a question about A&E, which um, uh, Stephen, I'd, I'd like to ask. One of the things that's important to the way that A&E operates here is the redirection policy that's been implemented and I think is working well. But I wonder if Malcolm or Nick would like to say a bit about that because redirection is very different from sending people away. It's sending people to the right place at the right time for the condition that they have and the treatment they need. And I think it would just be helpful to expand on that a bit. Well, can I start off and, and then maybe Nick, you can, uh, you can speak or, or, or Pauline. Um, first of all, we don't turn people away from the emergency department. If people come to the emergency department, then they will be seen. Some people who come to the emergency department don't necessarily need to be seen within the emergency department, but we could be seen by the GMED service, by the um, uh, minor injuries service, could be seen by a GP, could be seen by an emergency nurse practitioner. So the important thing is that when a patient arrives, A, they will be seen, and B, they will be seen by the most appropriate healthcare professional to their needs, and that's not necessarily within the emergency department. So really to be absolutely clear about that, we do not turn people away from the emergency department at ARI. If they arrive, they will be treated, but in the appropriate place. But Nick or Pauline, you might want to add to that. <coughs> Thanks very much. And just to reiterate, we've never sent anybody away from the ED department at all. But we did implement a redirection policy um, last year, it would be nearly a year ago now, um, and that was based on ensuring that, that people that turn up are seen by the most appropriate professional for their, for their condition. Um, and the, the nature of ED is such that it is a walk-in department, it's completely demand-led, um, and we need to make sure that the ED is protected, if you like, uh, for the patients that really need the skills um, of the staff that are in the ED department. So it is designed, if you like, for accidents and emergencies. Um, but the nature of, of, of the population and the expectations, uh, rightly, of the population is that they can access health advice and care 24-7. Um, so the, our Know Who to Turn To uh, program is the most important plank here, which is about helping the public to understand where the most important and where the most appropriate place is to go for the condition that you have. And as mentioned earlier, in advance of this winter, um, we, we posted every single household in Grampian with details of the Know Who to Turn To program to help them know where to go if they're needing some advice or help. So we, we did that. In addition, we have implemented the redirection policy at, in the emergency department. What that means is everybody that turns up is seen and assessed by a trained professional. Um, and that trained professional decides where the best place or the best profession is to deal with their, their particular complaint. And on occasions, and it's actually a very small number, on occasions people will be redirected, the patient will be redirected to another pa part of the healthcare system. That may be the GP out of our system, for, for example, it may be their local pharmacist, or it may be their GP practice in ours. Um, and that, I believe, is the right thing to do. It means that the patient is getting the right care for their condition, being seen by the right person, and also we're protecting the right parts of the system to be able to respond for real accidents and emergencies. Can I just say that, that that's not a unique thing to, to Grampian either. I think it's very important that our, uh, the, 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 the public, uh, through the public information campaigns that have been running uh, from the Scottish Government, uh, are given that full information. Uh, now, that might be slightly different from area to area, um, I was very impressed, I have to say, with the, the co-location that you have with the, uh, the, the GP uh, out of our service and the minor injuries unit, so it's very easy to redirect people just along the, the corridor. Um, but we are encouraging uh, other uh, boards to look at the, the redesign of their 
accident and emergency uh, facilities because I, I think we it is important that uh, that people get to the, the right place but importantly that they're not uh, taking up resource that needs to be used by somebody who absolutely needs accident and emergency services. So we'll continue to communicate that in the best way uh, that we, we can. And actually, I asked this morning about patient feedback and the levels of satisfaction with not just the a &E, but the minor injuries unit and the, the GP out of hours service was very, very high indeed. And I think that's, that's a good thing, but it is a, an, an ongoing communication uh, need, I think, to make sure that that information is, is put out in the, the right way. Yeah, hello. My name is Robert Payton. I'm the chairman of the Grampian Cardiac Rehab Association. We're a group that have been running now for about 13 years. We have a, a membership around about 670. We run about 31 exercise classes every week. We've done that for the last seven years without any funding from the NHS. Now, you said that you want to work closely with the third sector. The third sector can't do it without funding. It doesn't need anything like the funding that the NHS needs, but it needs funding. And I would like to know if you're going to ring fence funding for the third sector during the next up to 2020. Thank you. If I could first of all um, say thank you for all the, the work that you and the, the volunteers clearly do. I mean, that's quite a quite a, a, a figure, 670 people, 31 exercise classes, and I've seen a number of uh, cardiac rehab exercise classes uh, in various parts of Scotland and um, without a doubt they um, are keeping people out of hospital, they're keeping people uh, fit. In fact some people say they've been fitter through cardiac rehab than they've been the rest of their lives and have actually really addressed some of the, their uh, li lifestyle uh, issues that were uh, causing problems in the first place. So, um, so great, great work. Uh, I think uh, we, we do need to look at how we work more closely with the, the third sector. That There are some funding programmes that are directly through Scottish Government and we can make sure we get your details and we can send uh, you details of that. And there's obviously discussions that can happen locally as well. I think it is important that um, we don't just think about acute care, we think about services in the community to help people help themselves, to the self-help. Um, is really, really important if we're going to help people to manage their condition more effectively because that means that they're less likely to end up in, in the, the hospital sector. So the work you're doing is really important and I think we do need to look at whether we can support that uh, a bit more and we get your details at the end. We'll make sure you get all the information that you, you need. I'm just going to... I'm Susan Webb, I'm the Acting Director of Public Health. Um, Sue has actually been in contact with me and I think we're hoping to set up a, a meeting in the next week or so. Um, what I would say is that we, through the transitional leadership groups, have got some additional funding for some change programmes and I sit on Aberdeenshire Transitional Leadership Group and a large proportion of the, the, the funding is on the, the self-care agenda and they have made funding available for each of the local areas to enable them to take forward uh, initiatives that have been identified through the, the community activities. So I think there's a lot of connection that we can make uh, for you into the transitional leadership groups. But again, we'd like to reiterate the Cabinet Secretary, thanks for all the, the um, activities that you've uh, assisted with uh, to date. Thank you. Hello, my name's Joan Duncan from Stonehaven. Um, I'd like to ask about um, uh, walk-in referrals for x-rays, which are available throughout the rest of Scotland, but not in Grampian. Can you explain that, please? Um, 
I, I, I guess it'd be good at the end maybe to get a little bit of the context of you're talking about, but um, it, it essentially in terms of primary care services, um, we've got comprehensive access to a lot of uh, radiological services. There are some diagnostic tests that we put through um, to secondary care, and that's often around um, very complex or cross-sectional imaging, so CT-type scans and these sorts of things, to ensure that those uh, facilities are used absolutely appropriately for the um, individual, um, you know, so it's correctly directed. But the vast majority of our radiological services are accessible via request from primary care to do that. So in terms of walking to see someone in the community to then request the appropriate test for you, that, that's all in place. Um, the issue in terms of direct access to much more complex investigations, um, so as I say, as such as some CT scans, there are areas in which we're working to, if you like, get protocols and policies to make sure we use those facilities in the right way for right patients. Because, of course, all tests you know, carry some um, uh, risks associated with them, so you need to absolutely make sure that the right person gets the right test. Cabinet Secretary, can I just say thank you very much for coming along and for your uh, informed and informative questions. It's been uh, very helpful, I'm sure, for my team to hear them all. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and her team for coming along today and um, ask you, Cabinet Secretary, if you'd like to say the last few words. Very briefly, just to say... Um Thanks to all of you for coming. As I said at the outset, uh, this is a, a very important part of the annual review because it gives me, it gives the team an opportunity to hear directly from you as users of the service uh, what you like about it, where there's issues, where there's uh, more work to be done. And I think today has again been very helpful uh, on that. Grampian is definitely a, a board, it's, it's on a, a journey. There's more work to be done, but I think there's definite signs of progress being made with a new leadership team, great staff, good facilities, some more money, uh, all of which means that that progress can be accelerated. And I'm uh, very firmly uh, of the view that when we come back to do next year's annual review, we'll have seen even more progress. Malcolm laid out some of the priorities earlier on in the, in the, the presentation. And uh, without a doubt, I will, I'm very confident that the, the board will be uh, making uh, th those changes happen and that we will see Grampian uh, rise to being one of the, uh, the, the best performing health systems within Scotland and possibly beyond Scotland. So um, thank you very much. You can be assured that I will be uh, keeping a very close eye, as I do on all health boards around progress and that the, the guys here from, uh, from uh, uh, my team will be in constant uh, contact with, with Grampian uh, in a way that's helpful because it is about us providing the support that Grampian needs to continue its journey. So thank you all for coming and safe journey home.